So uh, we'll go ahead and get started on the final day of Bro Exchange 2013. This is Carl Kamen from 21CT, and he's sort of doing a case study about Bro use and looking through historical data. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you, Seth. Good morning. My name is Carl Kamen, and I work for a company in Austin, Texas called 21CT. It's been one year. And incidentally, that was about the time that they discovered Bro. Um, I think uh, they had a relationship with Ashish. So that's how we got introduced to, to um, Bro. So, all righty. All righty. I have not, there we go, there we go. Um, my background, I uh, got into security about 15 years ago when I was a uh, network engineer for a uh, software directorate at Kelly Air Force Base, and I was a civil servant, and I got hacked by the red team, and they uh, came in and did their stuff secretly, and I got invited to a conference room, and up on the, the display, along with all the other network engineers, was all of our problems. And uh, up till then, I didn't take security seriously. Back in the late 90s, we were busy building things, and nobody really thought much about security. There was this big race to deploy networks and functionality, and it was all pretty exciting. So I took it pretty personal, and I got into security that very day and started learning about security, and I um, made it a passionate thing to go fix everything. And I actually went and called and invited them back, and they said, well, we don't do it that way. We're pretty busy, but we're glad you fixed everything. And it was a couple years later that very unit moved into the building. Of course, if you remember, the BRAC Commission closed Kelly Air Force Base, and, and uh, the city owned all the buildings, and they happened to move into one of our buildings. And long story short, I got hired by the 92nd um, Information Warfare Aggressor Squadron as a contractor. So um, we started, do we did blue and red teams. The red teams was both remote stuff and close for about six years. And at the same time, we did blue uh, defensive assessments of military facilities. So we got pretty good at uh, assessing networks and um, yeah. the, the evolutionary path to bro for, for me was uh, this defensive mission where we started a host base analysis. And it was really involved. We, we, uh, we scanned boxes and networks as big as 25,000 uh, machines. The average probably size was eight to 12,000, so I've had experience uh, uh, scanning probably half a million boxes uh, in doing blue team assessments. We put a lot of effort into patching and, and uh, forcing a, a policy to get the Air Force to actually pat patch their boxes, and uh, there was a lot of flawed deployments of patching, and they would say it was patched, and of course, uh, you come in behind there and you could find 30, 40 boxes. It was just there for the taking, so it was a real, real problem. The um, vulnerability scans and patching and local and domain passwords was the focus for about five years until they realized, you know, there's, if you redouble your effort, there just isn't any more gain in it and that we're going to move away from uh, blue team assessments and not that the Air Force would abandon all those things there. There's still good things to do, but let's, let's assume now that they're in and let's go look for them. And that was a whole different mission direction, is hunting for advanced persistent threat inside networks. So uh, what, one of the things we did is we went to every, every single machine and downloaded a unique copy of, of every portable executable file we found. And we documented where we found it, what directory, what machine. And we imagined that after a while, once we documented this, that the malware would show up as onesie twosies here and there. But, uh, unfortunately, um, the experience was that every single box in the domain had uh, s a significant amount of unique files never seen anywhere. It was a quite, quite a surprise. This big data set we had, we had a big a triage process where we would take this big data set and, and, and through statistical analysis and some other things, and um, for instance, even trusting uh, Adobe and Microsoft and Sun, if they, uh, Oracle, if they had signed an executable, we would set it aside and make the basic assumption that it probably was a good file. Although that's not a very safe thing to do, written as Stuxnet. But um, whatever fell at the bottom of this filter, we had reverse engineers reverse engineering it. And we had some success, but it was very expensive and very hard to do. And it really did move us away from the idea of, of analyzing advanced persistent threat from the host. It was a difficult task, it's very expensive and didn't have much success. So we moved to the, we moved to the net. 
So, of course, the, uh, the military, and the Air Force in particular, really does lead the way in, in, um, in defensive sensors. They have a, quite a sophisticated suite of things that um, is on the edge of their networks, and, but the inside was pretty weak. And so what we did is we would, we would move to the inside of, of the network and look at critical assets and protect them with sensors, and uh, we used SNORTs and various GOTS tools and other products to try to uh, identify traffic on the network. Well, you know the problem with SNORT uh, and th things like that, the sensors, you only know what you know. Well, what, do you, what about the zero days and all that stuff? What about uh, things that you don't have good signatures for? And we found out it was very difficult to write um, good rules, noise, quiet rules where if there was an, an alert off the sensor system, then it was actionable and, and actually had, we, we eventually threw away all the rules and just had some very uh, limited set of rules that we had written ourselves. We sent people to classes, learn, write rules, and it was quite a project. Uh, we also included logs. We, we scarfed down every log we could find, whether it was a firewall log, a proxy log, DNS, DHCP, uh, server logs, we got it all. And we had a team of engineers going through looking for anomalous things. And there was some success in that success, but there's an, uh, these files were huge. You remember, these are big installations. They, they're, they're log files. Sometimes it would take days to download just the files from remotely just to bring them into our lab to test them, and that was a huge challenge. Again, you're, you're using the same bandwidth that, um, that they're using, so it's, it, you can almost do a denial of service uh, just bringing the log files locally just to read them, and that became a problem. So. So it was uh, several years ago that uh, Flow came up on my um, radar. I really realized that Flow had some uh, significance. And I, I, I guess I was telling Seth this morning, I was watching one of the NCSI Miami, or, or whatever it was, Los Angeles, and I saw the cop shoot a bad guy. And they picked up his phone, and they opened it up, and they could see that this guy had called a cop at 2 in the morning the night before. And so they had the flow record of a conversation. They knew who initiated it. They know how long it went and who it went to. <laughs> Probably in their world, that's, that's, that's damning evidence. You know, it's at least worth pursuing, but it's not enough to pursue for a network. I mean, you don't know what happened, and you can't say it was a bad connection. And if you've ever actually looked at flow, uh, the network's pretty messy. Just a simple visit to a couple websites, uh, in particular, that have news and uh, ads on the side, and there's, there's Java, there's tracker software. I mean, there is stuff running everywhere from a hit one web page. You might generate 30 connections. And what does it all mean? You don't know. You just can't chase it all down. So um, I went to the Flow conference because uh, I was interested in Flow in Austin in, in uh, January 2012, and, and uh, our company actually sponsored it. And I left my business card there, and six months later they called me and asked me if I wanted a job, and I said I was interested and ended up working for 21CT, and lo and behold, they're working with Ashish, and they had Bro uh, was on their radar, and they're very interested in it, and so I actually called back to the unit, and I said, hey, you guys, this is a cool tool you guys should look, look after. It's called Bro, and they said, we already found it. The month I was gone, they had already discovered to themselves, and so there's some military units are off and running with, uh, with Bro already. So, so um, we had a we had a, we knew we were going to get a uh, a job from a, a from a customer. Uh, we didn't know all the details, but you know, as a, the engineer and all of us wants to run right in the lab and set it all up. And how does this all work? And how does clustering work? And uh, how do you how do you actually use Bro? How do you extend it with some modules? And that we went on a we went on a um, a learning curve for that. Tried using commodity NICs, but one of the problems with commodity NICs we discovered was it really isn't so much the flow of, of data. The, a, a gigabit network adapter can pull in a gigabit of network uh, traffic. What it can't deal with is the packet, high packet count. When you're, when you're looking at a network and you get up to a gigabit network, as uh, from my experience, we easily see 150,000 uh, packets a second in both directions. So the commodity mix, what our experience fell down about 40,000 packets a second. They just started dropping traffic. And of course, this customer had no tolerance for any fuzziness. They wanted, you know, they wanted it all. They wanted high fidelity traffic. So um, I've been watching the bro list and PF ring, and I'm watching everybody struggle with it. I didn't really want to get engaged in that. It was too much of a, it was just a, too many variables to uh, a tackle. And uh, we do watch the bro list 
with interest. We read every post. Uh, several people in our company are very interested. We're, we're, we're subscribed to it and we watch it. So I had some experience with dedicated capture cards uh, and I did know about Endace and so we, we did buy an Endace card and, and um, w one of the things that they guarantee is that it does not drop traffic. It's guaranteed to not drop packets at the data rates that you're gonna see at that technology. And then we discovered uh, some interesting things about TAPS. Um, surprise, I didn't understand this before I went on this learning curve, but uh, it's possible on a gigabit network to have a gigabit each direction theoretically. In practice, it's hard to achieve, but you can see more than a gigabit of traffic because uh, from left to right and right to left on a gigabit network since it's full duplex. If you're using span ports or an aggregating tap that has the same technology, in other words, it's a gigabit out, and you're averaging over 50% on the left and the right, you're gonna drop packets. This, this just doesn't fit. You have to have the next order magnitude technology, so you'd have to have a, a gigabit uh, tap with a 10 gig out if you're gonna aggregate it, or you have to bring the left and right stream out to your, some device that can bring them back together and, and in a lossless way, so. Um, what we have observed in this customer, I'll tell you about it later, is that uh, they routinely, during the day, sit at 105 to 110% of gigabit. So you, if, you're just, if you're looking at a gigabit tap and, you, and you're, you're aggregating it, we would be dropping traffic, which we verified later with um, some other equipment. So um, one of the most important things that, um, in, in setting anything up is you gotta instrument it. If you're not instrumenting something, you're flying blind. You absolutely have to be looking at uh, the, the performance inside of a box. You don't know how much technology to buy. You don't know if you should have, you know, 16 processors, 32. Do you need uh, how fast your disk subsystem be? All the I.O. with uh, 10 gigabit, one gigabit networking, you know, direct attached storage. All those questions you have to find out. What is a good balance to spend money? Um, and where are you gonna spend it? So one of the things that I found out, I, my son and I do run a company in San Antonio and we, we do uh, use this cool tool called Zabbix. It's out of Europe or Latvia actually. It's a very nice tool. Um, let's see if I got a copy of it here. I wanna show you how it works. Um, so this is a, a system that we're watching. Um, out of the box, this thing is very easy to set up. Um, the screen resolution isn't quite what I have, but here's a bunch of boxes that you can see that, uh, that have no problems. Um, this, these out of the box, you can watch the network traffic in both directions on every interface, all the CPU, the IO wait time, you can watch uh, the disk utilization, you can watch just about anything you want out of the box. This thing is, is uh, pretty sophisticated. So for instance, I would, you can look here and see, let's see, where is the, um, maybe it's easier to see here, I guess. Here's some IO wait time, for instance, if you wanna watch a CPU, and you can see this, um, is that, I don't know how to get that up. There we go. So you can see here's a box, uh, it's a mail server, and something happened, um, it looks like last night at about, uh, you know, this afternoon is 15.30, there was the, the CPU went to a IOH time of 30%. Those are the kind of things you can't capture. When you, when it, let's say it breaks last night or an hour into the run, you're at lunch, you come back, the whole thing failed. What failed? If you're not measuring it, you're not charting and graphing it, you don't know. And so this is a very sophisticated tool. It, um, you can watch, that's the last hour, I guess, if you want to see what's happened in the last month. Um, there it is. If you want to zero in on something, it's very quickly will scale and show you. The gray is the weekends, of course, and the white is the business hours and everything else like that. So Zabbix, uh, we've used Zabbix now on our, on our Bro install. Um, no, that didn't turn out well, did it? There we go. We've used Zabbix uh, on our Bro installs and we, on the servers and the pieces of parts to watch where our bottlenecks are. And, and, and honestly, I think it'd probably be smarter in the long run just to buy a commodity uh, capture box or you know, buy a commodity Bro thing. But we didn't have that luxury. A customer had already bought some equipment. We didn't know what it was yet, but we were constrained to using what they bought. There was no new products to be brought into this. So that's a, that's a, that's a challenge that uh, whatever they have, you have to make work. So 
The other thing is uh, you might be surprised to see the CPAC and CView on there, but it really is an interesting uh, product. They had this product, and the CPAC it will allow you to watch the data rates, the packet rates, uh, any drops right from a web console. So you can see that if you're oversubscribed on a port, it'll show you your drop in traffic if you try to uh, send it out. It's a, this box is a 12 port box and, and I'll show you later how we actually utilize it. And the other thing is the Linux Systat tool set is really, uh, really nice. And if you got any skills at uh, graphing the output from that, uh, it's invaluable. That's a, that was my first, uh, my first um, uh, whack at uh, doing uh, some uh, metrics and measuring things. So we think that's pretty important. So here's what we did in the lab. We set up a, a gateway tap, and we brought it off left to right, right to left, and stuck it into the C view. The C view uh, model we had has, you can put one or 10 gigabit uh, uh, SPF in there. It'll take ethernet at one gigabit, or 10 gigabit is fiber. So we actually, we used the C view, and this is a little bit simplified, but on the left side, you see we're on TCP dump and just storing it. We want to see uh, what it was like to, because we, we knew we were going to keep the PCAPs, and then we, went, we had a 32, uh, we tried 16 and 32 bit, uh, uh, 32 nodes inside one box. And one of the problems um, that we found that uh, we're using hash load balancing, this, this, both these boxes have an end days card, and the end days card will do the hash load balancing automatically inside on the tuples and send it out. But one of the problems is um, uh, you, you can actually have one of the bro nodes actually uh, overloaded if you have a fast talker on the network. Remember, every, every bucket gets, uh, gets the same IP addresses. The two talkers end up in the same bucket. Well, if you have one big talker with a low latency, he's close and he can actually do a, a backup or a file transfer, one of these nodes can be overloaded. And so one of the cool things about the end days is it does allow you to have a FIFO memory buffer for each one of the 16 streams, you can have a 200 megabit buffer so that there's a little bit of grace there for if there is a burst of traffic, you don't drop the packets, they are processed moments later. And I really don't know how that works for how Bro handles that if one of the streams gets behind. We didn't uh, explore that. I don't know what the consequences that would be uh, as far as how Bro understands that uh, packets may show up a uh, millisecond later. I don't know. And then we did do this. We actually brought, I got them talking, two of them. We stuck two of them hash load balancing, and the cool thing about the C view is it does hash load balancing and parallel. So actually, this is simplified. Uh, the gateway tab comes in, and that's a 10 gigabit um, connection over there. This is hash load balanced, and then these are hash load balanced again. <coughs> Got it working, and uh, we are parsing everything into a um, relational database. It's an IBM. The tease is what the customer would eventually uh, reveal that they had. So. Here was our requirements from the customer. Um, we were not allowed to, for doctrinal and, and political reasons, I guess, uh, um, we're not allowed to sense real time. We weren't allowed to do the uh, clustering. Uh, everybody's familiar with the nine layer OSI model. Layer eight is politics and layer nine is religion. And sometimes a lot of our challenges in technology is not seven and below, it has, it's people. And it's kingdoms and rice bowls. I'm sure you've heard all that. That was one of our problems. So we were told that all the stuff we had learned about the clustering wasn't going to be deployed, that we were to, uh, another unit was going to actually make the PCAPs and give them to us. And eventually, um, jumping ahead here, but that whole system crashed, and I ended up building that system for them. But it's still the same, the same thing ended up working. So. We were to retrieve the metadata from the, from the PCAPs, and really, that's where we thought this is a perfect uh, tr opportunity to try Bro, bring Bro onto the table, and let's let's get all that metadata out, and then a method to analyze, correlate, and graphically display all the um, all the findings, and that's where our Linkseon Analyst Studio tool came in, and then a method to create and retrieve a sessionized PCAP. So what they would see is that the analyst would, would be working in the tool, he would find an interesting connection, maybe an alert, a notice, or something that he wanted to drill down on, uh, right click on that node and go out to the PCAP store and bring back a sessionized PCAP. The only thing I want in this PCAP, they want evidence because that's this unit's mission. They want the evidence. This happened, we can prove it in, and it brings up and automatically uh, pops up Wireshark in the analyst's uh, desktop and populates it with this file, and he can step through there. If it's actually valid, then they open up a case. 
they have, a, they have something that happened. Now, all this data has already run through a very sophisticated gauntlet of sensors. And this unit's mission is to find out what was missed. What didn't they see? What got through? And with the added benefit of when zero days get exp see the light of day, if your PCAP store is big enough, you can go back and see, did I, were we compromised two months ago or a month ago or how much storage you can afford? You can now go back and run those, you know, you can look for that information. You already have the metadata. You already can, you got the uh, intrusion set and the characteristics of it, and you can go look to see if we've been compromised. Um, so there's, there's an added benefit. And then the other thing is they wanted an auto trim so that there was no administrative maintenance uh, as PCAPs ended up filling up the, the network attached storage and then some direct attached storage. As, as, as they get full, you have to throw things away in the backside to make room for the new because they're coming in at a very fast rate. And then to trim the database, the relational database, for, uh, so that there were no um, information that didn't map to a PCAP. Remember, getting the sessionized PCAP is the critical piece. They didn't want them to look, find something that they couldn't back up with the PCAP. So these two had to be matched together, and that was one of the challenges of this task. So, so um, this is what they. This is uh, how the uh, collection system actually worked. Um, the C views employed, and the, it's a DAG uh, 754 card. If you know, that's a one gigabit card. So uh, the DAG card, out of the box by default, will take two streams. It's a four port card, but two of them will automatically be, you know, joined back together inside the card and presented inside the card a, on, a, on an Ethernet interface, a DAG zero, as a stream. So uh, that's, that was their deployment. And then there's a 10 gigabit uh, fiber NFS mount because one of the problems is if, if this system crashes, let's say you take it down for maintenance, this, the bottom box, the PCAP processor, this thing is storing data. If you only have one gigabit technology and they're tapping one gigabit, you can never catch up. So it's really important on this to, as you, if you collect gigabit data, it really became apparent that everything surrounding this system has to have a better technology to move the data around. You either, ca you either, you either have better technology, you have to go throw all that data away because you'll never catch up. That box will just sit there and perpetually be full. So. That was one of the challenges that um, uh, we came up with. So, PCAPs are, are traces with observer timestamps. Um, they have a 24-byte uh, global header on the beginning of every PCAP. An individual PCAP, if you want to look at one 10-second PCAP, in the middle of that PCAP, and Surprisingly, there can be as many on a, on a big basis, 200,000 connections that are alive inside that 10 second PCAP. If you look at it all by itself, and you just analyze it, you don't know the begin time or the end time of a lot of the conversations. You have to synthesize those times if you want to put them in a database. And they're just not true. So there are connections that started before you, this 10 second PCAP that run right on through, and you never see the fin or the sin. There are, peak, there are connections that start before and die inside that. They get to see the fin. There are connections that start in that PCAP and end, and then there are ones that start and you never see the end. So the problem is, how do you take all these PCAPs? This, is, this was the big challenge. How do you get Bro to understand this whole days with the data or some period of data and not break the state and be constantly fabricating times or use some other um, method. So what we did is we concatenated these PCAPs to lengthen the state, the time period between the, the breaking the state. So we had to decide, and it really was, a, the, the answer really was dictated by the, the space we had on the bro processing box. We had about five terabyte, six terabyte of RAID 10. It happened to be fairly well matched to a, a days with the traffic, so we went with 24 hours every, at UTC, we chop it off and move on to the next day. As soon as the server sees the next day has started, then these PCAPs are dealt with as one PCAP. We have a method of taking uh, every 10 seconds, if you know the math, there's 86,400 seconds a day. If they're every 10, you roll them every 10 seconds, then you have 8,640 of them. We jam these together and feed them into Bro uh, as one giant four and a half terabyte PCAP. Yes, sir. Well, because at a gigabit uh, networking, you have, um, you have a, uh, um, 
uh, you have 10, 100, theoretically you could have 125 megabyte a second. 10 seconds theoretically, if it was absolutely saturated, you'd have a 1.25 gigabit file. It's really the limit for bringing that one file up in Wireshark. I don't know if you've tried to bring a big PCAPS in Wireshark, but if it's a one gigabit, it needs a lot more in memory to expand all this and set it up and it crashes. Well, there was issues with crashing and there was issues with, uh, initially we had some bad hardware and there was PCAPs that would hang in Bro. And we're, we were doing it every 20 seconds and we couldn't open up the PCAP. You gotta, there's tools to slice it all up, but we just decided let's roll it every 10 seconds. And so they're about, during the middle of the day when the traffic is, is, is about as high as it can be, uh, they're about uh, 1.2 gigabyte of the, the PCAPs. TCP dump does a, has that facility built in. It rolls it and keeps the continuity automatically between them. Yes, that's an interesting question. We did discover if you leave TCP dump running for two or three months, um, some corruption can be introduced. Uh, we discovered that when they were trying to retrieve PCAPs. The same session, um, it was all within five different connections within the same second. They could retrieve four. The fifth one said it couldn't retrieve it. Oh, that's bad. So I don't know exactly what it is, but something about TCP dump running for five days. Maybe there's a better tool. But the problem is once this thing's in production, who wants to make changes? Customer's happy, it's working. And that's the problem when you go to the lab and make it an operational system and, and they got a business model built around this, suddenly you can't make changes because it's very disruptive and telling me you're gonna miss a day's worth of data because I wanna experiment with something and yes. The customer wanted to be able to open the files in Wireshark? Yes. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, that's the most important point is the customer. All this analysis, if they can't get the PCAP, the sessionized PCAP to create an incident, this whole thing doesn't work. That's the core requirement is that they had to have the sessionized PCAP. Now, when you get the sessionized PCAP, it's, it's much smaller. It may be as small as a few kilobytes. It may be a megabyte. But the, the, the problem of troubleshooting PCAPs as you're building this thing, the Wireshark couldn't open big key PCAPs, so we, we, we rolled it every 10 seconds. So the other challenge is there, if you're writing your disk subsystem, if you're writing PCAPs to a directory, that disk subsystem has to be able to pull that file off and send it somewhere for analysis and not interfere with TCP dump writing to that file. So you have to have a pretty good disk subsystem that has enough bandwidth to, to, to both write at the same time continually and move these files off. You have to move them, you can't just copy them, you have to move them. And that's not a small task, Giga, all gigabits of files and there's, there's I.O. problems with it. So. so that's what we ended up doing. So here's, the, here's quickly the anatomy of a PCAP. You have a global header, and then you have each, each, um, each packet has a, a header and a data, header two, data two, up to the end, and the global header is 24 bytes. So this is the structure of it. The header has the magic number, the version, this is all set by TCP dump, the snap length, and the, the ether, of course it'd say ethernet. So um, the, the uh, the PCAP going into Bro, you only need one header. You don't need all the headers. Well, each one of these 10 second PCAPs has its own header. So if you look at the record PCAP, here's where your time is stamped of the, of the event. This is the time stamp. You see the time in seconds and microseconds, the actual number of packets and the octets and the length of the packet. So what we did is, here's a visualization. Here's the, the, the algorithm for feeding them through. And this isn't, a, if you, for those of you who are really good at this, I apologize. Uh, basically in the end, um, the, the, the PCAPs pass a qualification. We look at every single PCAP as it's brought into the system. You look at it with, uh, first of all, just the, the Unix Linux file command and says, does it say it's a PCAP? Believe it or not, when you see corruption, they appear to be uh, Corel Clipart and Adobe something else or an unknown file. So. If this file is corrupt, we want to throw it away, but it brings a problem. You've just broken the state for the whole day. If it, you know the 3,000th one is broken, you've got a problem. You know, you've, broken, you've, got a, you've got a problem there with missing data. But, and then you go through there, and is it the first PCAP file, we run it right into Bro, because we want that first header. 
if it's every subsequent pcap for the rest of the day, you tail the pcap and cut, you start uh, tailing it at 25 bytes and forward, and then feed those through till you're done, and then you exit and you have this pile of CSV files in your directory, right? So here's what it looks like. PCAP's coming in with a header, and then we dissolve all the, we take all the rest of them off, TCP dumps creating them, and this is a cheesy one, I apologize for this. I put a lot of effort into this and it still doesn't work the way I want, it's gonna move on. We cut the headers off all of them, and then they all get jammed into Bro. Now our experience in the, and it, another thing is I couldn't figure out how to stop it from going to the next slide. So um, one of the things that, um, well I'm talking about, um, go back to that. Uh, No, it's not gonna actually play now. I'm not very good at it. So here's what it looks like. Um, this is the part that another unit owns. They own the TCP dump and the CView part. Um, this is a, a 10 gigabit uh, NFS mount. The PCAP processor that creates the PCAPs, or takes the PCAPs and, and makes the days with the PCAPs. But our Linksion server waits till there's a semaphore flag sitting in there. Just, we just touch a file and says we're done. It waits for that file, it goes in and brings them in and, and in the ETL process loads them in in the teaser database. And I know everybody, is, uh, this is what the customer had. Um, it works with our tool, everyone's in NoSQL, and, but this is one fast database. It is a big database, it's very expensive. Um, it has the interesting um, problem of about a three and a half to four and a half second delay for every query because it's the hard drive controllers are actually reprogrammed for every SQL query. But that's where its insane speed comes from. So we can go through five, six, seven billion records and you get an answer back in seven or eight seconds. It's an amazing, amazing SQL box. And then all the PCAPs are run out to these uh, NetApp uh, network attached storage and all these connections below from all these boxes are bonded interfaces. So again, the problem is we didn't have an all 10 gigabit technology. We had what the customer had. So what we did is bonded all the interfaces so you could have two, three, four interfaces acting as it's faster than a gigabit, but at least you can move the data out there and get it off the box fast enough. If you can get behind, you can actually catch up a little bit. And um, we did discover that uh, we played around a lot with uh, NFS versus Samba. NFS just blows away Samba in, this ex in our experiments here in speed. The problem is to make them reliable, they have to be hard links, and hard links give you now dependency of boot order because if the link's not there, the box stops booting until its, its dependency is resolved, it finds it. So. That's the setup. So the analyst studio, um, the analysts sit here and there's uh, a, a range of analysts. They, they make queries into the database and when they find something interesting, um, they can click on it and James here is gonna show you a real quick demo in the end here, a couple minute demo, will show you what it looks like. But they can right click on a connection or an alert or a note or something and say, I want that PCAP. And it goes out and brings them back and jumps it up in front of their face on a, on a, on a desktop, the, the PCAP, the sessionized PCAP. We did extend Bro, and this is my first effort. I did this uh, last uh, September. We have uh, uh, cookies were very important. Um, I don't know if you know, um, so this, is in, this whole process is, is informed by Intel, and they are very good about characterizing um, attacks. Uh, they call them, uh, um, you know, they have a, oh, I just lost my mind. Um, they have a character set, a, a characteristics around an intrusion set, there it is. And so uh, one of the things that are very important is cookies. Cookies is an out-of-band signaling. Cookies are a very sneaky way to exfil data, to uh, report success if the, if the uh, kit was installed on a box, uh, frequently uh, cookies. So they really wanted cookies. So a problem with the cookie is it's a 60, you can be, I think a 64K is the limit for a cookie string. It's key value pairs delimited by semicolons. And I don't think there's, a, I think there's not a limit for how big they can be, but it's a many to one, and this is the module that we use to uh, put cookies into the database. So, um, the, uh, the, uh, one of the things that became important is that the point of observation really determines what analytics you can write. If you're outside a netted firewall, you don't have the opportunity to see which workstation actually made the call. So if you do find an alert, you have to correlate it with firewall logs or proxy logs, and these are the, the two things that actually break the internet paradigm. I originally learned TCP, oh, 
no box between you and them should ever keep state. Well, proxies and DNS, proxy and natting firewalls do keep state. Uh, they are keeping state of your connection. So um, that was th those were some important considerations. Uh, for DNS, DNS, um, someone mentioned Snowflake last night. Every single network has a different DNS setup. And DNS is, uh, I think, is one of the most abused protocols on the internet. And the reason I know that is we made big hay out of that when we did red teaming. We used DNS for command and control, for beaconing. Uh, we could tell whether uh, our, our agent was up on the box simply by a DNS called our server. Uh, DNS is difficult to intercept um, between the workstations unless you're in front of the server farm. So if the DHCP lease gives them their, their domain controllers as their primary DHCP server, if you're observing outside their firewall, you're not privy to any of that data. So a lot of the considerations for Bro is, uh, and I'm a big proponent of a Bro everywhere on a network if you can do it, but um, the other thing is you, you really, I'd like to see an out of band uh, communications, you're not traversing the same network. Um, in other words, a, a private network to, in a back plane so that the only traffic here is your traffic. Um, the time source for PCAP creation is a really big deal. Um, since you may be correlating these events with people in other time zones and uh, the military, everything is locked down to a network time protocol. And so your observer timestamps these PCAPs and it's very important that you that the, when, when the TCP dump writes the time on that packet, because it's not on the wire, TCP dump adds the time. That's the problem with TCP replay, is when you replay it, you strip off all the time, and then the cadence is even off. So the uh, network time protocol and what uh, is, is important, and the challenge here was, of course, this is an enclave, and getting, uh, getting, a, um, getting a, a, net, a NTP source into there is difficult. And then they made the decision is everything is time stamped in UTC because it's, there are worldwide consequences, and so you may consider that. Um, I talked about this a minute ago. We did discover uh, the cluster uh, problem with, uh, if you got one truck in the network, all that goes to that one bucket, and that's a problem. You can overload, um, you can overload that, that one bro node. So when we, I remember what I was gonna say earlier, when we, we found out when we fed um, these uh, days with the PCAPs, our actual rate, I think it says 80 megabyte in the documentation, typically a node? Uh, yeah, that's old data. We actually experienced 43.5. That's how much we get in this process. So we only get, and this is a pretty, pretty fast box. I don't know if it's a consequence of real running for so long that it may not be linear in its time. It, 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 could, be, uh, it could just be something configured wrong. We, we typically see about 200 megabits per second, but I know one site we hit 500 megabits per second per core. Per core. Yeah, we're experiencing a lot less. So there, I'd like to tune that better. I don't know, and I'm at a loss to what it is. I'd like to learn how to make it faster. Um, we did this, we can do, although with this box we got with some experiments, we can do up to eight days at one time if we want to get caught up. We can, if, if they fit on the box or if your network attached storage is fast enough to go get them, we can do eight days at one time before the, the IO wait time gets so high that it's all just a crazy exercise and there's no, there's no gain in adding more days. So um, this is, this is some, some indicators, some important things about indicators to look for in your bro data. Um, if you can, if you're at a place where you can observe this, uh, failed authentications, authentications outside of business hours, and of course you, you may have cases where people are allowed to remote in, depends on your corporate policies and people are allowed to remote in, but an eight to five business, why would someone log in at two in the morning if no one's supposed to be there? Those are, you know, that's activity inside the network. Someone's actually logging into a domain controller from there. Uh, multiple concurrent logins at disparate hosts. If it's, if it's hand interactive login, how is someone logging in at four or five hosts at the same time, if you can, if you can capture that? Um, service account abuse, many service accounts um, have uh, uh, passwords that are actually embedded in a script, that's what they do. But they generally come from a couple boxes, any, any connections from service accounts to around the network from other um, IP addresses um, is, is, is mischief. User agent strings. What, we know this. We know this happens. The user agent strings are used by everything: your antivirus, your your Java updater, your um, uh, Adobe has one. Everything that has a, that communicates out. There's a user agent string. So we do. Uh, 
sort these and count them and look for one-off user agent strings that, um, that have small per per perturbations. What they do is um, they'll, they'll go by a drive-by from one website and you'll see um, stage one come down. If it successfully installs, it goes out to get stage two of the kit. Well, the thing about getting stage two, if you don't have the exact right user agent string, you get a 404. You can see a, a workstation go out and get stage two. You get on the keyboard right behind them, go to the same website, and it's 404. Because you, you're using Google Chrome or you're using uh, IE or something, and they went out with their own user agent string. And it looks just like a Microsoft IE one, except a O will be a zero or there'll be some other little little change in the user agent string. They're pretty long, but there's something different about those unique user agent strings that it's called door knocking. Um, and you can find uh, frequently the second stage kit can be discovered by user agent strings. And cookies. So cookies are, we think it's a big deal. Um, uh, the customer thinks it's a big deal. Uh, it's an important piece of uh, an analysis is, is looking at what cookies are exchanged from the clients. Uh, they do communicate that way and um, you, some intrusion sets have known um, cookies, let's put it that way. DNS, if you have DNS, and we've spent a lot of time uh, looking at bro data and figuring out DNS, the problem is you, you, DNS is a distributed database. You don't really have access to um, all the conversations. A DNS, uh, a DNS record comes with a time to live. So if you want, um, if you want your, your DNS information to uh, uh, die real quick, you give it a low TTL. And the reason someone would do that, one of the reasons is that you can have a conversation with a, a host. A lot of chatty DNS to a host with very low TTLs is ind indicative of malware. They can uh, exfil data and information and uh, actually control the box. So sometimes the answer coming back, you see a dotted quad address, but those aren't actually an IP address, those are a catalog of instructions. Different numbers mean different things. Go to sleep, clean yourself up, and, or try to spread yourself, make yourself persistent in a different way, uh, go get another update to, the, to your kit. All these answers come back, and what's interesting, if someone looks, um, look, does a DNS lookup and there's no follow-on connection to that site, well, that's pretty interesting. They looked up a uh, www.whatever.com and then no one goes there. What was the purpose of looking it up? Unless there's an admin or a sophisticated user on the keyboard in an engineering environment, you might see a lot of that where people are playing around with DNS and on the keyboard, but uh, connections with uh, no lookup are, uh, look like mischief. The other thing that's very interesting is the, the host name entropy. Now, I know you, you might want to write a module for it, but it's pretty easy to see with your eye. You know, you, you have a pretty good idea. Everybody can guess which one of those two actually has more entropy, those, that host name. You can see it. Well, what's the point of it? Some of that is actually reputation lookups for Manavirus, or a mail server will do that. You'll see a lot of mail servers going out to McAfee doing reputation lookups, and they encode the lookup. So you have to kind of learn to ignore certain boxes. But if you can filter out the noise, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, host name entropy can be important. Low TTLs, um, so a, 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 a caching, your local DNS will cache a, a, a request that he's looked up and he's not authoritative over. And if the user sends, if the, if the owner sends out that information and says you can only, with a two second TTL, then the client gets the information, the database is in memory and, and DNS goes through there and, and decrements every second all these TTLs when it hits zero, they throw them away, they're supposed to. Um, so, a lot of mischievous uh, DNS has very low TTLs, but there are cases where, um, for instance, I'll show you an interesting one that I like to use is uh, nslookupcnn.com. They use it for round robin database, do round robin load balancing. So, it's very low TTL on cnn.com because they want you to use a different server. Everyone who looks it up, they don't allow you to cache it because the TTL is very, very low. And so, every lookup, they come out in a different order. See that? So, you'll see a lot of big server farms, a lot of Akamai stuff, a lot of uh, people who want to have a, a, a large server farm and want to do load balancing. This is how they load balance. They load balance with DNS with low TTLs. Um, it doesn't come back very gracefully, does it? Okay, cache poisoning, you know what cache poisoning is? You look at your DNS records, two minutes? 
Five minutes? Oh my gosh. I was worried I didn't have some information. Um, uh, we'll, we'll finish it real quick. Cache poisoning is when you look up something and the, the, the server that's been compromised sends back a glue record, and the glue record is... Um, Just hold, it. Just hold it right here. I don't need one. I think they do. I don't need one. Um, cash poisoning is when there's an unsolicited glue record comes along with your lookup. So you go look up, um, you go look up Google.com, and along comes an unsolicited record attached to it. That says, "Oh, by the way, Bank of America is this IP address." So anybody in your your, or your unit looks it up, it's cached, and they go to the bad site. So glue records are bad. You want to look for those. And you want to look for DNS requests that bypass your corporate DNS. Um, engineering environments are difficult. They're all kind of chaos. But if it's an office environment and the, um, the, uh, the hosts are told by their DHCP server to use the domain controllers, and they, for most part, do. But every now and then, a, whole, a workstation goes out to the internet and asks, goes VFR direct right to another workstation to another DNS server makes a lookup. That's probably embedded malware where they've hard-coded uh, a DNS resolver to go out and look and bypass the local resolver on your box. So, all right, and today um, our company wants to announce that we have a, we've committed to Bro and we have developed a, a Linksion Bro connector so that we can uh, have a, a little more sophisticated method of actually um, uh, parsing bro data into our databases. So our, our, our engineers were, have built this and they want to announce today that uh, we now have a, a bro connector because we're committed to using bro uh, beyond this one customer. And that's, that's uh, so. Um, we have a really quick demonstration. We can, a minute? Okay. James Lawler, my uh, associate, with, uh, has a has a demonstration of uh, our Linksion tool. I'll give you a really quick uh, look at it. Just plug it. Are you sure? Okay. Excellent. Yeah, because boy, that's awesome. There's my wife. <laughs> it's always dangerous showing your own desktop. <laughs> you never know. It might be there. All right. Back. All right, cool. I'm James Lawler. I work with uh, this guy, Carl, 21CT. I want to give you a real quick demonstration over uh, one of the use cases we use in, uh, for our product down at uh, the customer we have. One of these use cases is uh, using threat feeds or intelligence feeds to go ahead and robust the current data sets that Bro provides. And in this case, we have an InfraGuard threat feed. This, what you're seeing here, I know. Okay, so let's back up. Here's our analyst or analytic catalog. This has a catalog of pre-canned analytics that we thought were really interesting. So for a power user, you can actually go in and create your own analytic. Yesterday, after hearing Seth's talk, I was like, well, wow, yeah, top K, this is awesome. So I went ahead and created a Seth's top K DNS query. And this is how simple it is, and this is PQL, by the way, really simple, really quick. I just went ahead and hey, instance DNS, DNS meta, and then export out the DNS query, then give me a count by descending, and here's the real quick output of that. And so, yeah, hey, there's our DNS queries, top 10. You can do as many, top 100, all, whatever. Um, but just kind of the quick, how powerful our tool can be, and you can actually use it to do a lot of the things that, of course, the some stats are bro, that will allow you to do anyway. But we do it on our side as well. And so after running the analytic where we have an InfraGuard threat feed, so we, we ingest, we have this capability to ingest threat feeds from different places like ISAC, InfraGuard, wherever, and then we can go ahead and tag those as blacklists. And then we go ahead and run this blacklist analytic against all the IPs that's ever, that's still in our database. And so once we run it, we kind of see, oh, hey, this is, we actually did have one hit, and this is the hit here. Here you see the external connection, and it's actually, here's this little tag, and that's the blacklist tag. And so we see here, we did make two HP get requests or whatever kind of request from an internal host. Here, here's the connection data. And this is all broke log stuff. This is bro connections and you see kind of the information there. And real quick, I kind of want to figure out what happened around this guy. What, what kind of request did he make? And so I'm going to go ahead and expand relations. Um, give me the HP meta where this is the destination. And so, let's see if the demo works. Oh yeah, okay, cool. So we got this little magic button here and let me go ahead and... So we got this HP get request that actually happened here. And they, they're looking for Virus Doctor. And so with Bro, the power of Bro, we actually go in here, 
And we'd be like, okay, so what all was happened? You can kind of either cursor over it, which that's working real well, or you can go to properties and you can real, real fast click on this and say, hey, this is what happened. And you see, oh, hey, there's MD5 hash. Well, that's interesting. So let me go ahead and see where else, anywhere in my entire enterprise, this MD5 hash showed up. And in Linksion, we can actually real quick do a create a search pattern. And, I, and I, what I did, I clicked the internal host, external host, and the HP meta. And I'm gonna go ahead and now do a create search pattern. And so then it's gonna hopefully bring up, yes it did, um, the uh, little create search pattern area. So real quick, I just wanna like simply define some criteria. I need an internal host, so we have this is internal flag. And this is all set up where we go in and install Linksion. We actually get your internal IP range and we put it to this internal Boolean flag that you can actually go ahead and run analytics against. And then uh, we have this external host. We want to go and put, yeah, we want. In any case where we have an internal host talking to an external host where this MD5 hash was downloaded. And so let me find that because this is a really, okay, here we go. I got my glasses on and everything. And so real fast, and you kind of see right up here a little quick little rundown of what you just did. You can actually come and send this to the pattern editor, which I showed you earlier where I did Cess top 10 K uh, DNS queries, or you can go and run it directly out of this. And so we're gonna go and execute search pattern. And oh, hey, lo and behold, we actually have results. Okay, so I didn't can this, did I? And so um, we're gonna go ahead and put this in the existing link explorer. We're gonna go ahead and press the magic button because we got those. And this is the Mac client, it's still in beta. But hey, here we go. So we do have that, and this guy was actually internal host. HP get request to an external host, and he asked, for the website or went to the website H Drive Sweeper. So how awesome is that? Real quick, real fast, the power of Linksion with bro data. So real quickly, right click on this, this connection object right here. Yes. Normally if you have the bro uh, store, right here will be a, an option right here to retrieve the PCAP. You click on it, generally 20 seconds later on your desktop in the PCAP is the sessionized PCAP for that connection. And it would be right here under search other sources. And we have like a whole capability to do other sources, like say if you want to rob text something, you want to do something somewhere else, and we can right click into either PCAP if you actually have it, and those kind of things. Any questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, questions. Oh, wow. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> we right. put them to sleep or we yeah, everything? Yeah, hey, thank you guys so much for your time. <laughs>